<clears throat> welcome to the night. Welcome to the stream, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you out there for joining us for the Cicada 33 on live stream. Big congratulations to our winner already. Um, so basically how this works is every once in a while when the Cicada token team decides to grace us so generously, we will be giving away Cicada tokens during these live streams. Uh, tonight, obviously, it was, could you guess a certain word in the live chat, as I said there in the, you know, top of the live chat pinned, and the word happened to be pyramid tonight, because we'll be talking about Nefertiti, right? Now, I started this out with the desolation video, because I thought it's a very accurate description of sort of a modern day what happened in the past, right? So in the past, there was a world, all these pyramids buried worldwide by the flood. And we look back upon that past almost as if we look back upon the past of our world, where we're seeing these like great cultures that we've built being destroyed, not by a flood of water, but by a flood of sin and soon to be a flood of fire. So, <clears throat> anyways, I just thought that was kind of interesting and sort of just, you know, <laughs> there's nothing new under the sun, right? Uh, so, the token giveaway video, obviously, we had the setup. I wasn't sure if people would get it before I played this or not, but basically, this is, you know, the little video that was put together for the giveaway. So, here you go. It's only 33 seconds long, of course. So congratulations to Joshua uh, Mowdy. Sorry, Joshua Mowdy there in the chat. I have no idea how you figured that out so quickly, dude. But that was very well done. Now, <clears throat> before we get into this, back to my show notes. We had a new find, by the way, out there. So people are finding uh, various you know, little things out there and whatnot. I have something to show you guys. Um, that comes from an ancient Nefertiti tomb as well. Uh, so I'll show you that. I'm not going to show you that tonight. I'll let you guys hold your breaths on that one for at least another night. We'll, cut, we'll show you that in the next live stream. But I have something from ancient Egypt that uh, very, very interesting. So if you guys can guess what it is, I will show it to you. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> so I just found some stuff near Echo Park, Los Feliz. Do I get a prize? It's like an older letter with weird shit I can't read. So you can see here, I had an old letter. He found some stuff. You seem to have found the prize. The seal is intriguing. You found enough to get that letter. So here you see him digging it up, found his old letter. And then you can see here Cat comes in. Congratulations at Lost Angel. That's a significant find. You will receive tokens. Do you already have a MetaMask crypto wallet? And there you can see someone else receiving tokens as a gift for finding these, you know, various artifacts and letters and things. So, as we've been saying since we started the treasure hunt, and <laughs> I'm the pirate captain, there just so happens to be buried treasure out there. I don't know if you guys are picking up on the theme here. What did pirates like to do? They like to hide their treasure from the crown, right? So, <laughs> all around the world, there's these, like, hidden buried treasures and things all over the place. I didn't hide them. But, you know, other 
Allied pirates certainly did. I would say probably Thomas Schoenberger buried a lot of these things, especially the ones in Europe. So, <clears throat> that's just my guess. I don't know for sure. Anyways, it could be an entire network of people for all we know. Anyways, someone else found one. Another prize out there. Now, Queen Nefertiti. We have a little video that was put together by, you know... The team, the Cicada team, so here's a little video, and shout out to all of them for all the help with the research and things of that nature. Special shout out to Thomas Schoenberger, Sophia Music, for all the music tonight, and for uh, Marsha Stockton for her help, and hopefully I pronounced that correct this time for once. <laughs> but she's been on the ball researching stuff all over the place, so big shout out to her. Really, really appreciate it. Today, mateys, we look at an ancient queen, the elusive and mysterious Queen Nefertiti. The music is courtesy of composer Thomas Schoenberger of Sophia Music. Why is Nefertiti so famous? Nefertiti was a queen of Egypt and wife of King Akhenaten, who played a prominent role in changing Egypt's traditional polytheistic religion to one that was monotheistic. worshipping the sun god known as Aton. Cicada 3301 is in the habit of burying treasure and we like finding treasure, don't we, mateys? Arr, matey! So Cicada 3301 sent me a mysterious object and dared me to discover its meaning and age. The only hint they gave us was the most hated queen in old Egypt. Naturally we figured it had to be Nefertiti, not Cleopatra. Let's get a little background on the mysterious Queen Nefertiti. During the 14th century BC, ancient Egypt underwent radical religious reforms under the reign of the heretical pharaoh Akhenaten. His great royal wife and queen of Egypt, Nefertiti, was a powerful and influential figure during this time of profound cultural upheaval and even rose to the rank of co-pharaoh and eventually sole pharaoh of Egypt. Her beautiful and elegant limestone bust has rendered her one of the most iconic and legendary figures from the ancient world. Nefertiti is believed to have been born in 1370 BC, but her parentage is still somewhat of a mystery. One theory asserts that she is the daughter of a top advisor named Ai who went on to become pharaoh following Tutankhamun's reign. A major flaw in this theory is that neither I nor his wife Tay are ever clearly referred to as the parents of Nefertiti. Tay's only documented relationship to Nefertiti was that of a nurse of the Great Queen, which is an unusual designation for the mother of an Egyptian queen. Another theory proposes that she was the daughter of Amenhotep III, thereby making her the full sister of her husband, Akhenaten. This is also unlikely because none of Nefertiti's known titles are among those generally given to the daughter of a pharaoh. The newest theory to gain some traction among Egyptologists links Nefertiti to a Mitanni princess named Tatu Kipa, who was initially married to Akhenaten's father, Amenhotep III. This is due in part to the meaning behind Nefertiti's name, the beautiful woman has come, which has been speculated to imply a foreign origin. Nefertiti married Prince Amenhotep IV when she was 15 years old, several years before he became pharaoh and changed his name to Akhenaten. Despite the pharaoh having multiple wives, records show that Nefertiti and Akhenaten shared a close and intimate relationship, having six daughters together but no sons. Their daughters' names were Meritaten, Mikataten, Anxenamun, Neferneferaten Tasharet, Neferneferar, and Setepenre. 
Nefertiti held many titles throughout her life, including Hereditary Princess, Great of Praises, Lady of Grace, Sweet of Love, Lady of the Two Lands, Great King's Wife, Lady of All Women, and perhaps most importantly, High Priestess of Artin. Akhenaten and Nefertiti were the primary driving forces behind the religious revolution during this period, forcing the people of Egypt to abandon their pantheon of gods in favor of worshipping a single deity named Artin. Artin is best described as being the disk of the sun that was originally an aspect of the sun god Ra. Artistically, Artin is depicted as a solar disk emitting rays with small hands on the ends. The famous stele of Akhenaten appears to show the royal family being touched by the rays of Artin. Worship of Artin was nothing new, and even the previous pharaoh Amenhotep III and Queen Tie had revered Artin above all other gods, but never to the same fanatical extent as Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Queen Nefertiti wielded much greater influence over the empire than previous Egyptian queens and eventually rose from the rank of consort to that of co-pharaoh alongside Akhenaten. Nefertiti is depicted beside her husband in art more often than any other Egyptian queen in history. She is frequently presented in positions of strength and authority, such as conducting worship of Artin, driving a chariot, and smiting enemies of the empire. Nefertiti's sexuality, as evidenced by her exaggeratedly feminine body shape and her fertility, as observed through the six princesses' repeated presence in art, suggests that she was regarded as a living fertility goddess. Nefertiti designed a commanding, tall, flat topped blue crown for herself that is theorized to represent a female version of the Kapresh, which was a war crown popularized by Pharaoh Thutmose III a century earlier. By their ninth year in power, Akhenaten and Nefertiti had declared Artin to not only be the supreme god, but the only one worthy of worship. They ordered that temples dedicated to Amun be vandalized or destroyed, and that images containing any god other than Artin be banned. Akhenaten and Nefertiti eventually declared that they were Artin's only messengers, altogether supplanting priests and other religious leaders. The aristocracy viewed this sudden shift towards monotheism as a significant threat to the empire, but largely went along with the royal couple's reforms. Many priests of Amun hid texts and artifacts, saving them from Akhenaten and Nefertiti's wrath. Towards the end of his reign, Akhenaten went as far as to declare himself and Nefertiti actual gods, and demanded that they be worshipped as such. Nefertiti was eventually elevated to the position of Egypt's sole pharaoh after the death of her husband, and subsequently changed her name to Nefenifa Ruiten, meaning beautiful is the beauty of Artin. It's theorized that she might have masqueraded as a male pharaoh named Smenkare as well. As pharaoh of Egypt, Nefertiti undoubtedly became the most powerful woman on earth. Nefertiti holds the distinction of being the second New Kingdom female pharaoh after Hatshepsut, and the fifth of a total of seven women to ever become pharaoh during ancient Egypt's 3,000-year history. Hesitant to relinquish the throne to her nine-year-old stepson, Tutankhamun, Nefertiti wrote to the king of the Hittites, Sepiluliuma I, My husband has died, and I have no son. They say about you that you have many sons. You might give me one of your sons to become my husband. I would not wish to take one of my subjects as a husband, I am afraid." This was an extraordinarily desperate proposition because New Kingdom Egyptian royal women never married foreign royalty. Awestruck by Nefertiti's request, Sepiluliuma responded by sending his son, Prince Ananza, but the marriage never happened because the prince was assassinated en route to Egypt. This attempt to marry a foreigner was likely viewed as treasonous in the eyes of the Egyptian elite, and some have speculated that she was murdered shortly afterwards because Nefertiti soon disappeared from the historical record forever. It's a mystery as to whether Nefertiti died at this time or simply surrendered her throne to Tutankhamun, who married her daughter, Ankh-Senamun. Upon ascending the throne, his advisors convinced the young pharaoh to reject Artinism and restore the traditional worship of Amun and the old gods. 
He also abandoned his parents' city of Amarna and re-established Thebes as Egypt's capital. Tutankhamun's successors, particularly Horemheb, demolished many of Akhenaten and Nefertiti's constructions and used the rubble for their own building projects. Ironically, Akhenaten and Nefertiti are now two of the most notable figures from all of ancient Egyptian history, while most of their detractors have forever vanished into obscurity. In 1912, a German archaeological team led by Ludwig Borchardt unearthed the portrait bust of Nefertiti at the ruins of an Amarna workshop owned by a royal sculptor. The bust was first shown in a Berlin museum in the 1920s, and it quickly gained international notice, rendering Nefertiti one of the most recognizable and beautiful female figures from antiquity. German dictator Adolf Hitler was particularly proud to have Nefertiti's bust in Germany's possession, describing it as a unique masterpiece, an ornament, a true treasure. One of Hitler's top officials, Hermann Göring, considered returning the bust to Egypt as a political gesture, but Hitler strongly disagreed, saying, I will never relinquish the head of the Queen. The bust was hidden away in a German salt mine during the 1945 Allied bombings of Berlin and was discovered by American soldiers near the end of the war. Egypt requested that the United States return the bust to its motherland, but they refused and advised Egypt to take the matter up with the new German government. The bust is currently housed in the Nyes Museum in Berlin, where it had been on display prior to World War II. The location of Nefertiti's tomb remains one of the biggest mysteries in the field of Egyptian archaeology. Many Egyptologists believe that finding the legendary queen's tomb will be the most significant discovery since Howard Carter's famous unearthing of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. Through her incredible beauty and unparalleled influence, Nefertiti has captivated the world and become one of the most recognizable and legendary figures of the ancient world. Is this a sun, a flower, or a sunflower? Let's discuss. <clears throat> So there you go. So this is an image right there of the artifact that I have <coughs> from Nefertiti's tomb, right? So this thing, is it, you know, a depiction of the Aten, right? The sun god, the one god, the mono... And this is the first... Is this one of the first times they had a monotheistic religion in ancient world i believe it is all right so fairly significant all right <clears throat> first time there's the one true god thing where before it was like various gods as you saw in the uh, thing there it's just sort of interesting As you can see, some of the show notes are notes to myself, where I'm like, play the Titus History lesson video so I don't forget to do that. <laughs> These are show notes, which means I use them to conduct the show. <laughs> so here you have the elusive, mysterious Queen Nefertiti. The music is courtesy of Thomas Schoenberger. You know, this is what I, the script for the video there. <clears throat> and this right here is the video that we grabbed it from. Right, so this right here. Drinking warm water before bed fixes tooth and gum problems like over. The full video, the most hated female pharaoh. Nefertiti ancient Egypt documentary on history explained so please go over and give them a like on that video for letting us watch it and use that clip under fair use for educational purposes all right so when you look at it is it a sun or a flower or so I think it's the iron that's being you know depicted there and then as you saw in the thing like she had the one eye missing right and you see that in a lot of like 
the you know Illuminati type stuff with the one eye missing and whatnot. Here you have, take a look at the missing or glazed eye of the queen. Ties to Odin with his son and two ravens, question mark. Which is interesting, right? The Odin connection potentially there. And I don't have this ready for this very moment, but let me see if I can't find it really quickly. Uh, no. I'm not sure which one it is in this, but it's in one of these. In the early ones. think this is what they're depicting with Nefertiti I just found that this is like an interesting thing I think what they're depicting with this is like the Dijal right so I was trying to find you for that was that maybe it's ready for more pain at the dentist question two could increase dental costs for consumers but uh, fuck I'll just look up the Dijal The Dijal basically has uh, one eye, right? Right here. <clears throat> Prophet says about Dijal that he is one-eyed, his right eye, as if a protruding out grape, right? So I think that's what they're depicting with that, right? With some of that stuff. Anyways, here you have the Nordic sort of connection here. What is this? Sorry. Yeah. There we go. Medieval texts call our knowledge about Odin. Researchers disagree on the Viking conceptions about the god Odin. The source material is ambiguous and difficult to interpret. Today, the general conception of Odin that is one-eyed chief of the Norse gods. However, when it comes to the general conception that was prevalent in Viking Age, researchers disagree. <coughs> Excuse me. There are no contemporary source texts of pre-Christian religion. Researchers need to use medieval sources. This has given rise to a multitude of interpretations. The story and text have been handed down from medieval ages are marked by the Christian way of thought and that was a characteristic of the time. Because of this, it's exceptionally challenging for researchers to estimate where the information regarding the god can in fact be traced to the Viking Age. The different academic backgrounds of researchers have also influenced the interpretations of the original Odin as various research trends and methodologies that have come into play. 
Up until now, research history shows us that the method for understanding Odin has been wrong, says Annette Lassen. She holds a PhD in Norse philology, uh, philology, uh, <laughs> I can't say that word, <laughs> philology from the Department of Scandinavian Research at the University of Copenhagen, and has been recently published a book available in Danish only on the diverse representations of Odin found in medieval texts. In her analysis, she has reached the conclusion that researchers should weed out the Christian perception of Odin in order to arrive at the original conceptions of the god. Regarding medieval texts, a single heathen text, and extrapolating an image of Odin from this is not a viable option. The texts are very diverse, she says. Christian traditions have colored the image of Odin. The medieval texts paint a picture of Odin in the Icelandic writer Snorri Sturluson's CA 1178-1241 handbook for skalds, the Nordic chief deity is portrayed as a skaldic god, and other texts present him a war god, while others still depict him as a devilish figure. Some sources know him as an immortal father of the universe, resembling the Christian god, while others see him swallowed by the wolf in Ragnarok or dying from old age as an immigrant nobleman in Sweden. The texts vary partly because they are drawing upon Christian traditions and partly because the writers have different intentions with their texts. The description of Odin is tied in with the Christian model of interpretation employed by the writer, she says. According to Lassen, there are a number of Christian models, interpretation for dealing with heathenism dating back to the early church. <clears throat> so basically, like, you know, are these guys taking Odin from Christianity? Is that, like, the descriptions of him, you know, is it not that Christians are taking from Nordic traditions? It's that these, like, traditions that were written up in the medieval times are actually borrowing from Christian earlier traditions. Yeah, BB Bay says, Noah sent out a dove and a raven. The raven never came back. The raven did explain where it went, though. <laughs> so, the raven, right? Uh... So, <clears throat> so like, what? How did Satan, like, if like Lucifer had fallen to Earth and he was on Earth, how did he survive the flood? Right. So God asked him this. He's like, you know, where did you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And the Lord said from... Oh, that's not the actual... Where's the old... The words he actually uses are going to and fro. That's the key word because <clears throat> Lord, the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from going to and fro on the earth, from walking up and down on it, to and fro, right? Now if we look for raven to and fro. And he sent forth a raven which went to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. So where did Satan, what was Satan? The raven. 
going to and fro. And when Satan answered the Lord, where were you? He said, I was going to and fro. Right? Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth. Right? So the raven that Noah released was Satan. That's why he also had the dove, right? <clears throat> All right, so now on to the Liber Primus. Finlay on Discord said, quote, Titus was right. Liber Primus is a music puzzle it was not chromosome, it was chromatic, as in music. And then he linked in here chromatic. Sixteen hundreds in music, involving tones formed to the normal tonality of the scale, not diatonic. From Latin chromaticus, from Greek chromatokus, relating to color, suited for color, also used in reference to music. From karma, genitive chromatos, color, complexion, character, but chiefly used metaphorically of embellishments in music, originally skin surface. Greek also used chroma for certain modifications of usual diatonic music scale. The reason the Greeks used this word in music is not now entirely clear. Perhaps the connection is extended sense of chroma, ornaments, makeup, embellishments. <clears throat> Reference to color, the intensity of distinctive hue, degree of departure, color sensitive. So, like the interesting thing here, you see here, destitute of color, transmitting light without decomposing it into constituent colors. So music can be turned into various things and can be used to encrypt things. So here Cat states this on Discord. Sound. <clears throat> Infrasound versus binaural beat. Definitions. Infrasound sounds below the limit of human hearing. Below the 19 hertz, binaural beat equals... Two frequencies played together. Bi equals two, oral equals ears, one in each ear. Acoustal physics, when two frequencies sound together, either in the ears or ambient, the momentary amplitudes of each sum together, producing troughs and crests, spaced wider than the input frequencies. When I tuned pianos as an odd job in college, you listen for beats as you bring two unison strings in the tune. This is a fair diagram of the beats, which I forgot to copy in here, of course. See if I can't... Find this diagram. Mm, I'm not seeing the one that... Uh, I'm seeing anything that really gives you a great idea of what I was trying to show you. Uh, I guess this one is the closest. Not really, but it'll do, I guess. <laughs> Basically, um,. If you take like two different instruments that would be two different waves, take remove the brain from this picture, and then you synthesize those two different instruments into one beat, like you have here, instead of going out, imagine if it was going into the beat. So instead of going out through the earphones, if it, the beats were going into the earphones as microphones and then coming together as one one beat. That's kind of what the binaural beat thing is, right? That's what that was trying to show you. Using technology, we can simulate infrasound 
by selecting the right two or more frequencies and playing them together with similar amplitude. The same occurs in nature all the time, but we can't perceive it directly. Just had a long talk with Thomas about this. This is one of his topics we keep kicking around. Let me explain his hypothesis. We'll be back in a several hours to speak for himself, but he asked me to write the substance of our conversation. And this is all stuff that was in the Discord, so if you were all in the Discord, you would have seen this anyways. This was all stuff in the Libra Primus uh, Discord room. Infrasound happens organically. For example, the Mongolian throat singers combined with percussion and low-frequency instruments think didgeridoo. It can be a hypnotic tool. Think brainwaves. We'll come back to this later. An auditory frequency around that range of between, let's say, 6 to 15 hertz. Neurons would fire, stimulating that particular brainwave pattern, yes? Don't quote me in the exact numbers. We have to look it up. Thomas is talking about encrypting sound frequencies. Figure it out. Animals telegraph with sound below human hearing, below 15 hertz. Humans can hear well between 15 hertz to about 19 kilohertz. Our perception of the higher frequency range tends to drop off with age and in deafness. That's interesting stuff there, Troggy Trog, that you're talking about with the uh, chromatic <laughs> five-headed dragon over there. That's interesting, bro. On uh, Odyssey. Thanks for chiming in. What's up there, Anna, Co Anna Cooper? Chiming in over on Rockfin. Nice to see you. Thanks for dropping in. Inanna, the star flower, Anunnaki. Yes. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> Sulfur cipher right here. So people were talking about this in the Discord, and I thought this was one of the things that we had talked about in the past, and you know, trying to figure out how to solve. Uh, the Liber Primus and these various things and I do think that the Sulfa Cipher is like one of those uh, like little bits of you know how do we solve this thing type paths that was on the right path like I think this is something that people should take a little bit closer look at um, and then if you, you go here and you go to Sulfa Secrets you can find out that in here gives you a lot more information and it allows you to do it in other languages as well to decode like multiple languages you see all the various ways and like this is really interesting stuff you can see how it's encryption through music right where you can use the various like you can see how like you can change these things like oh change treble D major and then like this is the key right to figuring out like how to decrypt the puzzle right and then it gives you the cipher algorithm down here do re mi fa so la ti right and then you get the different letters of the alphabet from that with one two three and four So I, I think this is definitely on to something here. You can see like the various like magic square almost type things, right? Snap kill is like click the secrets, click the secrets. Yes, exactly. Snap kill. I think you're. Were you the one that dropped this in there? I don't know, but so whoever was saying this in there is definitely. I don't know for sure, but I think this is, it's a little bit above my pay grade because I'm not a musician, but it's, it's very interesting, right? Right. 
So you can change like the sulfa key to alto, major, Phrygian, eighth, right? And then you have a different key right there. And it's like the keys are all around you, right? So is that is that like how you're gonna solve? Is the various keys that Thomas is using in his songs are those like how to solve the Liber Primus? <laughs> that would be interesting, wouldn't it? He's like, the keys are all around you, and it's in all these like songs that he puts out. He's putting out the keys like right in the song. That'd be kind of funny. Wouldn't it? No, if you do is like use the sulfa cipher to figure out the various uh, letters or you know various pages of the Liber Primus. Here's this really interesting Tribonacci word music. So you get the point, right? <clears throat> and I thought there were some pretty interesting images that were dropped. And this here above, as a string vibrates or a tube fills with air, proportional waveforms are created in the whole number ratios that occupy the same space, giving rise to harmonic series or overtones. Unity subdivides into infinite smaller units. Each one of these overturns a station or stopping point, a gravitational pull acting upon the other tones nearby. So it's just amazing how our reality actually works when you see it in like these things. It's really just amazing. It's like so like obviously the result of design and not just like accidental chaos when you see stuff like this. thought this was interesting in there as well these different um things that were dropped in like you can see like backhand notation indian early 20th century indicate rag tal tempo as well as melody so you see like the different ways people wrote music but it's all like kind of similar right 18th century chinese Medieval Europe, 13th century. And then here on the top, you have Song of the Sekilos, Greek, 200 BC. And of course, the Greeks had the best way to do it. That was obviously the best way. This guy here found some ancient interesting... It's got a... Yeah, the Italians were the ones that did most of this with uh, an Italian priest named Antonio Vivaldi. Now, I'm not condoning the rest of this guy's work or anything. I just thought this was an interesting thing. 
this segment here. Vivaldi. Yeah, was the, the one that really pushed all before. But all, all of the Italian musicians, particularly uh, uh, Frescobaldi and Gabrielli are, are, are two of them That's, that developed the initial polyphonic music. And then Bach became the master of it. And then Handel was the great popularizer of it. So you Handel, Bach, Vivaldi, Gabrielli, and uh, and what was the other one? Gabrielli and Frescobaldi. Um, Martin Luther was the beginning. He wrote the initial pieces of music. For the organ of the church. Well, the initial... Uh, that was still the Pythagorean modal music. So all this comes from Pythagoras. Yeah, it all comes from Pythagoras. Modal music, you call it. Yeah, it's uh, the only pieces of it remain. It's called major and minor. Major and minor. Yeah, well, those are all part of what are called church modes. Church modes. Yeah, those are extensions from the original Pythagorean system, and they had the distortion factors. Bach finally distorted the whole thing and erased it, and made it a, a pure logarithm. So music from every at that point on, always sounded harsh. But that's the only way he could play in all keys. Otherwise, you had to retune the organ for every key you played. See, the voice didn't matter with the voice because you could move the frequency everywhere. There was a stringed instrument, but the organ is the first digital device. It's an analog computer, but it's a digital keyboard. So now you're stuck to discrete frequencies. So every key, you have to retune the organ. The pipe organ is one of the oldest. And with all the stops and the pipes, it's an analog computer of an incredible complexity. It's a waveform synthesizer. They the organ's a waveform yeah, synthesizer. they can't make them anymore. And the old ones are all the metal fatigue and everything. They're all rotten. It's all gone now. They can't make them anymore? They don't know how to make any of that stuff. Are you serious? It's too complicated. They couldn't do it. None of, none of that can be duplicated. That was made by masters. They just did it all in their head. The guy that made the made organs with 15, 20,000 pipes. You know how he measured the spectrum? He went into the church and, and took a stick and threw it on the ground and listened to the echoes, let that cook in his head, and build a 15,000 pipe, pipe organ out of it that resonated with the church. And there was no insurance back then. If you fucked up, your head got fed to the fish. <laughs> but no pressure, right? <laughs> It just simply worked. It wasn't a question question whether it was going to work, because if it didn't, you died. So these masters that made the organ, that was it. Was Silberman made, made most of the great organs in Germany. So who? Silberman. Silberman. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't know who made it. France had their own brand. Fr France made some incredible sounding organs, but they sounded different than the German organs. And so then the English, you know, had, had their organs and all that, and, and all of them are, are resonant. They're analog computers. You build waveforms by adding harmonics. You can make any kind of waveform you want. And, and the physical feeling of being in the churches when these things are running in full power is beyond description. Really? Particularly when all the planets are lined up. Wow. Scares the organist. The whole th church sounds like it's going to come apart. The organists start to lose control. The whole thing gets wrapped up into the cosmic event. The and, just goes, party. and just goes wild. And it uh, leaves the audience in, in complete shock. Thousands of people just like stunned in shock. They, they had a grand organ concert at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco right during the planetary alignment. That church was smart. They played that whole solar cycle and they did a series of 12 organ concerts. Half of the music was Bach. And, and, and it got nearer and nearer the planetary alignment. The performances started becoming more and more stunning. And larger and larger quantities of people started showing up. So finally, the last one, there's only one seat to sit in in the whole church where all the phases line up. We'd always get those seats beforehand, hours beforehand, and make sure they were reserved. Your family? No, me and David. Oh, here? Yeah, in San Francisco, David Franklin. So they had an organ we could, we, we were doing that whole Sonoma State study, and the organ concert series was in that exact sync with the solar flares. And you had, to, of course, you were there at every one of those concerts, and they just lit that church up. We spent days preparing for these events, hiking around in the woods, and, and just like living on fruits and vegetables, you had to take at least a 10-mile hike before the organ concert, what? and then get there at the top of that mountain, and, uh, and then there's a couple other things you do, and you have your seats are all arranged, 
right, where all four organs, pipe organs, cross. In the cross of the church itself, they're all built like giant crosses, and they have four organs in them. They have the forward and reflected organs, the giant ones in front and back, and then they got the side organs, and there's two seats on either side of the aisle in the middle, and you get those seats, all the waves add up in that spot, and it produces, you go out of your body. You just go out, during the concert, you just go out of your body. You're not even in, in normal world anymore. The whole thing just completely overwhelms you. And you can actually see the music and the whole, but just in that one spot. So the, so the grand concert, the church was too crowded. So they had to put everybody out in the main thing. But the, uh, the organ concert built up so much power uh, that the whole church, went, right after the concert ended, the whole church went silent. There wasn't any applause. And the organists were like frozen, staring, like with weird looks on their face at their keyboards. It's the whole place just like went dead. It was quiet. No one was clapping or anything. And then all of a sudden, all thousand people jumped up for a simultaneous standing ovation like the, the church had never seen. It just it just blew everybody away. How long was that standing ovation? It was, uh, it was, the concert went on for about two hours. And it built with, you know, like one of Bach's most famous uh, organ works, the, the horror movie one. The God in Fugue? D minor. Yeah, he, oh! wrote, he wrote that when he was 18 years old, but I don't like that. It's juvenile and it's too dark and whatever. But these guys and the church and the alum. All right. <clears throat> so it's interesting stuff, all right? Now, if we take a look here at music and electrical images, the oscilloscope music. I'm not proper. Hello. Polish. This sound is also a Picasso. Well, kind of. The fancy looking machine is an old oscilloscope from the 1980s. Oscilloscopes look complicated, but in essence they're very simple. Here's how they work. The display is just a dot that gets moved by electricity. If you move the dot fast enough from left to right, the dot becomes a line. You know, it's sad. I use something like this pretty much every day. <laughs> if a line has a shape, we often call it a wave. Turning a wave into an electrical signal and sending it to the speaker turns the electricity into a sound. You can send that same electrical signal to an oscilloscope, which turns the electricity into something that you can see. This is what my voice looks like when the same signal that is going to your speaker right now is viewed on the oscilloscope. If you've got two waves, you can turn them both into an electrical signal. You can send one signal to the right speaker and the other signal to the left speaker. You can also look at them on the oscilloscope by letting one signal determine the horizontal position of the dot and the other determine the vertical position. If both the signals are identical, then the shape is pretty boring, just a diagonal line. But when the signals are different from each other, like on a stereo music track, then the picture gets much more interesting. This is a snippet of Shaker Fist by Hot Chip. Before we go any further, I'd like to show you all a game I made up. This game is called Sounds of the Studio. They're chaotic looking displays because the signals that go to each speaker are very different, so the dots all over the place. Here's a clever bit. If you look at two carefully chosen signals on an oscilloscope, the dot will trace a picture on the screen. Played through speakers, the signals will also make a sound. Here's a pair of signals we've made using the brilliant open source program Aussie Render by James Ball. And that's how the sound is also a Picasso. When you view the signal that makes the sound on an oscilloscope, 
you can see a copy of a line drawing by Pablo Picasso. So pictures can describe sounds, and sounds can describe pictures. There's a genre of music called oscilloscope music. The artists make music that also create visual effects when viewed on an oscilloscope. This is some of Jerobeam Fenderson's oscilloscope music. And that's it. Links to the things we've used are in the description below. Thanks for watching. Extremely interesting stuff. That's from Sounds Like a Picasso Oscilloscope Music Veeb Projects. So make sure to go over there and give them a like and all the type of stuff. Boom, there it is, the like. So I want to promote them for, you know, using their, pirating their clip there. So much appreciated. It's for educational and fair use purposes. Okay. So one of the interesting things, I, I, I heard a conversation um, from a 2017 solver, right? And he's, he's talking about music and he makes a connection to the Lord of the Rings and Tolkien and all of that. And I'll just have you reminded that the Lord of the Rings comes from the Silmarillion, right? And the Silmarillion starts out with what? Ainulindala, the music of the Ainur. There was Eru, the one. So what does the heavens begin with in the Silmarillion? It begins with music and frequency. Much like the Bible says God spoke, like God said let there be light and then there was light like god spoke the world into existence in our actual reality that's where tolkien probably got the idea from who in ardor is called Ilúvatar, and he made first the ainur the holy ones that were the offspring of his thought and they were with him before aught else was made and he spoke to them propounding to them themes of music. And they sang before him, and he was glad. But for a long while they sang only each alone, or but few together, while the rest hearkened. For each comprehended only that part of the mind of Filovata from which he came. And in the understanding of their brethren they grew but slowly. Yet ever as they listened, they came to deeper understanding and increased in unison and harmony. And it came to pass that Ilavatar called together all the Ainur and declared to them a mighty theme, unfolding to them things greater and more wonderful than he had yet revealed. And the glory of its beginning and the splendor of its end amazed the Ainur, so that they bowed before Ilavatar. And was silent. Then Iluvatar said to them, Of the theme that I have declared to you, I will now that ye make in harmony together a great music. And since I have kindled you with a flame imperishable, ye shall show forth your powers in adorning this theme, each with his own thoughts and devices, if ye will. So but it's I... all about music. The entire beginning of the Silmarillion is all about music and how the angels of heaven were making harmony together and making song. And then the one bad angel, you know, decided that his song could be better, right? We will sit and hearken and be glad that through you great beauty has been wakened into song. Then the voices of the Ainur, like unto harps, and lutes, and pipes, and trumpets, and viols, and organs, 
and like unto countless choirs singing with words, began to fashion the theme of Ilovata to a great music. And the sound arose of endless, interchanging melodies woven in harmony that passed beyond hearing into the depths and into the heights, and the places of the dwelling of Ilovata were filled to overflowing, and the music and the echo of the music went out into the void, and it was not void. Never since have the Ainur made any music like to this music, though it has been said that a greater still shall be made before Ilovata by the choirs of the Ainur and the children of Ilovata after the end of days. Then the themes of Ilovata shall be played aright and take being in the moment of their utterance, for all shall then understand fully his intent in their part, and each shall know the comprehension of each. And Ilovata shall give to their thoughts the secret fire, being well pleased. But now Ilovata sat and hearkened, and for a great while it seemed good to him, for in the music there were no flaws. But as the theme progressed, it came into the heart of Melkor, to interweave matters of his own imagining that were not in accord with the theme of Vilavata. For he sought therein to increase the power and glory of the part assigned to himself. To Melkor among the Ainur had been given the greatest gifts of power and knowledge, and he had a share in all the gifts of his brethren. He had gone often alone into the void places seeking the imperishable flame for desire grew hot within him to bring into being things of his own, and it seemed to him that Ilovata took no thought for the void, and he was impatient of its emptiness. And so you're starting to understand, like, it's a mirror image of the Bible, basically, like, you know, the head angel that leads, you know, the music turns on God, etc., etc., but that's interesting that's all about music in the beginning of the Silmarillion. And then you take this note here from an old <coughs> interview from Sam Blythe and a 2017 interview. Shows up into the, into the image. And in the Germanic side of things, we were able to produce a lot of more, a lot more substantial. Hold on. Got all the interpretations of everything. He was right around there. I wanted to start. It, if you convert it, it says Orkwin with an H instead of a Y or an E. And it does what it does. It is a file name and it's got all the interpretations of everything and condensed it down. It's using proper file name etiquette to uh, make it more of an efficient way to recognize the file. And the same can be applied to the timers on the web page of the same name. So orcs and Gwyn is the two particular parts of the of the, of the file name. The orc basically throughout many Norse and other Germanic based religions and Falaka mythologies Orc is always, before the modern J.R.R. Tolkien era, they were just evil spirits. They're just... And even uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, when he developed the orcs in his famous Lord of the Rings series, was inspired based on these old Germanic myths of these evil orcs, these evil spirits that would go around and cause havoc upon him. Gwyn, the G-W-H-N part, is actually... A pretty clever reference because it utilizes uh, Gwyn Ap Nude. There's two ways that his name is pronounced it's Gwyn Ap Nude and Gwyn Ap Nude. And it's spelled similar to how Flood is spelled in the image. So, and not only that, but it also the way it spells itself is WH represents the Wild Hunt. It's a pretty clever type of thing. The file name, so Gwyn was a 
head leader, uh, a proud Germanic you know, ruler. And when he died, he became part of the wild hunt as a soldier among the Norse. The Norse who led the wild hunt, which was this war of spirits and gods that clashed out with each other. Uh, Odin was the one who fled the Norse in this wild hunt. And orcs were also like a main factor into it. So, and referring to Odin, he was described as a a one-eyed god who is half raven, half wolf. And a lot of it shows up into the into the image. And in the Germanic side of things, we were able to produce a lot of more a lot more substantiality, especially with the picture itself. The ravens that are aligned together in the, in the image, if you use the cicada their heads and this primarily the cicadas as the reference point, it maps out Corvus is the raven constellation and however and using that constellation type idea the fox is looking up to that bird up to the bird and is standing in the same position as lupus the wolf and yes this would make sense and it would connect to odin in some way and thus connects to the wild hunt however a lot of a it's a fox, not a wolf, and that's misconstruing. Why is a fox being represented like a wolf? Well, the a lot of Enochian hermetic, the Enochian symbolism, the alchemic symbolism, the even the hermeticism was all there. It was it's all like directs from a place known as Sumer which was the root of mankind, the root of civilization. Go. Mm -hmm. And as Sumer was the root of civilization, we can use that as a reference point, especially due to a lot of symbolism that has been inspired from these Sumerian philosophical revivals. And Sumer astronomy is very interesting, and especially how they classified their animals. The fox in Sumer was no different than the wolf. It was the same. They are one and the same. So, as such, because using the Sumerian symbolism, we can confirm through all these pathways that have connected Sumer to various Sicadian puzzles in the past, we can accurately, accurately say that the fox is the wolf. They are one and the same. And as such, it, all, it would connect Odin into the picture itself. And then I want to talk, start talking about Rome now, because Rome is, we've, we were on to the point where we need to discuss the Rome side of things, because it all connects together in some manner. Uh, the Worms My Eye and the Court of Wood, there, I mean, this puzzle can be taken to so many multiple interpretations, and they all connect around the same ideals. However, they are not the same messages. And as a cord of wood, this hope, this the, the meaning, the tone of hope uh, of what possibly be done, especially in the stars, I mean, we're, I mean, a lot of what I mean, SpaceX wants to do. What are we all looking for? Okay, let's go travel and terraform Mars. That's like the big thing. That's what the hope is right now. And... Mars being the war god. A lot of the Roman side of things is more based on 
war and battle instead of hunts, instead of the, the people. It's more in terms of war, battle, victory. Those types of ideas run out there. And, it, and Mars was a very slightly an arrogant bastard of a god. It's a very interesting interview. Um, you guys can check out the rest of it. Uh, I think it's they bring up some pretty interesting stuff. Um, it's over there, Cicada 3301 2017 update interview with Sam Blythe from NFG. So you can, guys can go see it there. Um, it just confirms a lot of the stuff we've been saying and then ties in some of the Norse stuff and all that. And I thought the interesting conversation about orcs and all that, very interesting. So with all that being said, um, that's the end of the show tonight. I will be back to do more cicada shows on a regular basis, and I'm going to start trying to dig in and do my own research as part of that and try to solve some stuff myself with you guys, um, as I've done in the past. <clears throat> so you'll see more of me in the Discord in there as well. Um, as you know, I was more active in the past. I'll be more active in the future. Uh, I just had to get back onto Discord, so... Anyways, thank you to all the solvers out there. Um, I thought this Fishes and Loaves 5 would be a nice way to end the show tonight. And I will see you guys <clears throat> uh, back for another one of these streams soon. And make sure to be in the live chat when we go live on this channel so that you can win the Cicada tokens and be the first one. And next time you can beat Joshua to the punch or to the pyramid, if you will. So, <clears throat> hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you to the Cicada Token team for basically, you know, sponsoring this since they're the ones that will be providing the prize to Joshua or the gift. It's not a prize, it's a gift. Make sure you call it that too, their Cicada team, so that people don't have to pay taxes on it, right? You can gift $15,000 to someone a year, tax-free. So gifts out there everybody <laughs> when you when you tip a waitress you should always do it that way be like this is not a tip this is a gift anyways <laughs> hope y'all have a wonderful night enjoy fishes and loaves the beggars waltz all right good evening everybody